Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 12th of October and we're looking at some really important updates beginning with Kursk, then Kharkiv, Seversk, New York, Pokrovsk and finishing off with Vukhodar. So as I said at the beginning, instead of beginning with the Vukhodar region, I do want to sort off our updates with Kursk because this area of the front line is uh, more pertinent. There are more changes here that are of relevance to you guys. And you can see that in yellow, these are the advances by the Russian forces since my last video. So two days ago, you can see the advance amounts to roughly 23 square kilometers. I can't say for certain that it is that entire amount because there is a bit of doubt surrounding whether the Ukrainians have retreated entirely from Olgovka. But as you can see over here with this geolocated marker from October 10th, this is a video of one single vehicle of the 109th VDB division. It's an armored vehicle advancing along the paved road that we talked about in the last video, the one that connects to the eastern outskirts of Kuranovo over here, and then move southwards and connects to the Ukrainian rear within Kursk to several really important nodes that will be converted and have been converted over these past three months into Ukrainian fortresses with the hopes of extending Ukraine's presence in Kursk. That includes Verdlikovo, which was previously an area with a Russian bunker and a local company position, moving southeastwards. Also, Suja connects to there, so it is a really important outpost for the Ukrainians here in Suja. It's the largest settlement they have under control within Kursk, and it, not even close. It's by far their largest garrison. A lot of the brigades that are operating across the border, they do so with this being their nexus. And so the road connection here is really, really important for coordination. And then also in order to prevent the Russians from advancing along a said road to attack Suja from the flanks. So that's a long term concern. But for now, the Russians are, of course, advancing along that same road. And what it does threaten is essentially eliminating any possibility of the Ukrainians ever returning to the eastern outskirts of Koronovo. That's one of Ukraine's uh, original failures with this offensive, the fact that they were unable to actually infiltrate and begin hostilities within the town itself that I'm marking with X here. There was a point in time uh, within the later stages of August when the Ukrainians were uh, really knocking on the door of Karanovo, and that was also around the time that clashes began in an area like krasnik tiaborskoy and that was essentially Ukraine's final opportunity to turn the Kursk operation into much broader than what we see right now. Because really what would have came after such an attempt and successful capture of an area that is essentially acting as a conduit between the Kursk rear and Glushkovo, it would imply that the Glushkovo district would eventually fall as well. And by that point, you'd have the Ukrainians taking over another potentially 700 or 800 square kilometers of territory located south of the Seam River. That would be a huge gain and a way to extend the fighting here for much, much longer. But due to the Russian garrison here in Karanovo succeeding in holding on to its initial positions at the outskirts, preventing any deeper push by infantry, vehicles were able to make it in, but they were quickly broken up. Whatever columns were there were taken out individually. And the Ukrainians just sort of meandered over the past two months near the outskirts. And they tried to uh, get around this, try to get around this very strong Russian defensive posture east of the town by attacking in areas like Olgovka, Durovka, Petreno. And there have been some disagreements as to which of these villages were at any given point in time under their control. A lot of conflicting reports with a lot of Ukrainian sources indicating that the situation was relatively fluid with the Ukrainians able to infiltrate rather deep into the Russian lines towards areas like Cheputovka, Zhravli, Kalinov, etc. And that included clashes that occurred for a while in Olgovka and Kremianoi. Kremianoi, I'm still marking as a gray zone in certain portions because we don't know about those regions. And Olgovka, there was definitely a Ukrainian presence there up until recently, probably up until the Russian counterattack that we're seeing uh, that has unfolded earlier this week. And now, based on the latest geolocation of the Russians advancing along this particular paved road, it makes it very unlikely that the Ukrainians would still maintain forward squads operating in this basically three-kilometer narrow corridor that is so detached from the main Ukrainian garrison. Uh, basically, there's no physical connection to another village for another 12 kilometers before you reach an area like Krugolankoy and Novo Ivanovka, 10 kilometers away, is currently at the line of contact. So uh, there really wasn't any good route by which to connect to Olgovka. So although it's possible that the Ukrainian forces were still there for several days or are still here in a much smaller capacity, just trying to buy time, 
Uh, that's not going to be a permanent state of affairs given the Russian advances along the highway specifically, which make it very difficult to maintain any tenable forward position in this enveloped region to the north. And the same thing would also go for Kremlinoi. And the Russians, they did also launch successive uh, attacks in tandem to the ones that occurred around Novoy Ivanovka and around this highway through Kremlinoi. And that's actually been happening even before the other two axes that I mentioned. So earlier this week, around October 6th, that's when the initial attacks by the Russians began from Sheptuhovka all the way to Kalinov. And there is footage from the Ukrainian side of the 82nd Air Assault Brigade and the 41st Mechanized Brigade just targeting various columns of Russia's 810th Naval Infantry Brigade. That's the main unit involved in these assault actions. Uh, and for a while, they were able to keep them at bay near the outskirts of Kremlinoi. And then over time, you can see how the geolocations from the Ukrainian side showing damage done to Russian vehicles shifts from the outskirts to the actual village itself. And there is some proof of that from uh, recent times, like October 10th here, which shows their unit 82nd. They dropped grenades onto various Russian positions in the houses themselves. And so now at the very least, it's in a gray zone. But given how detached it is, again, from the line of contact, there is a possibility that it has been completely abandoned by the Ukrainians, although we are waiting for additional footage. You could see how the Russians, with this three-pronged attack, they were going for this goal of essentially eliminating any threat that could be posed to eastern Karanovo. In that regard, they've been successful. They do still have to get control of Ukrainian territory that spans from the current line of contact and to basically 10 kilometers eastwards, Krugel and Khoi in order to create a huge buffer through a lot of the open areas where Ukrainian vehicles uh, really thrive upon because they are able to go through without encountering that many static positions or troops and they also can use the foliage to their advantage. Uh, but as a more long-term goal, as you can see the shape of this Russian advance, I do think the Russians have in mind Malaya Loknaya for uh, two possibilities. I suppose the maximalist scenario would be uh, to combine it with an assault from Kamyshevka and then try to cut off whatever forward Ukrainian garrison is remaining in Pogrebki and in nearby villages. But again, that uh, is something that really hasn't materialized in a lot of efforts, offensive efforts during this war to try to cut off large groups of forces. Usually the forces are able to withdraw in time. And so then the other objective would be to just gradually squeeze out the Ukrainians from these forward positions and take over these areas that are largely on ridges. A lot of the open fields that you see that we talked about here between the line of contact and Krulenkoi or between Malaya Loknaya and over here Kozita or Ruskoi Prechnoi, they actually are in re relatively high elevation. I talked about this in the last video as well. The areas on low elevation would be the uh, areas adjacent to the rail line, the chains of villages. And so those regions are not very easy on their own in isolation to defend, but taking over the nearby regions, all those hills, that would give the Russians a great outlook position to fire towards the remaining Ukrainian lowland defensive holdings near the border or in Suja itself, which is also really on low elevation. So that would be a uh, long-term success for the Russian side. And so uh, we're going to keep track of the developments here. The Ukrainians, like Deep State, they're saying the, that the forces here are trying to create a stabilization and they're not intending to, you know, order this general retreat all the way to Suja. They are trying to create a line in all likelihood running from the Novo Ivanovka area to Pogrebki, for instance. Right now, Deep State, based on their own gray zone marking, they actually show an even larger chunk of this village, Novo Ivanovka, as neither under Russian or Ukrainian control. It looks something like this. And so definitely the Russians are operating deep over there and trying to secure a foothold east of the paved road. It's rather interesting because you have Sirsky saying that around 50,000 Russian forces are now involved with operations here. About a month or a month and a half ago, the number was around 30k. So the Russians in this buildup period that occurred basically following the stabilization of the front line over here, once the Ukrainian uh, gains on a daily basis began to diminish. Over that time period, the Russians were able to take advantage of the stalemates to send in additional forces from uh, naval infantry units, from VDV, territorial units. Uh, and in terms of the main sectors taken from, Sirsky himself has said that it's mainly from Kherson, Zaporozhye, Chasivyar. And I would also add, he didn't say this, but also from the Vovchansk region. And so in terms of the Ukrainian goal, of redirecting Russian forces away from key parts of the front line. Uh, I suppose you can say that it helped in regards to Chasiv Yar uh, because you can see definitely the operational pace over there has really slowed down due to movement of elements of the 98th and 106th 
divisions away from those particular areas. Uh, although changes still have occurred over there, Russian advances are just at a slower pace than they were beforehand. Also, that has to do with generally other sectors being even more important than Chassis VR and the new division between the Russian and Ukrainian lines and Chassis VR being built around fortified positions in the Donbass Canal. Also, I would say in Volchansk, a lot of Russian forces were moved away from there, and that would be in, in a region where definitely the offensive has helped redirect attention away because a lot of Russian territorial units from Army Group North were redirected to support the main efforts the defendant in the Kursk and then counterattack. And that definitely played a role in allowing the Ukrainians to either stabilize or conduct their own localized counterattacks in Volchansk. So, so that would be the nuance in uh, favor of Ukraine. But then long term, looking at the most important parts of the front line that basically span from southern Donetsk to the Pokrovsk region, those areas were really not affected that much. You could count on uh, probably bare hands the amounts of elements of units that were moved away from Pokrovsk. It was not a large amount. You had some PMCs that were moved away. You had certain elements of DPR units, but you're talking about a, a really limited amount. We're talking about battalion-sized forces that were moved away, and the garrisons in those regions are, you know, tens of thousands large, nearing upwards of 100,000, and so it's not really substantial by any means, and we all know empirically that the amount of Russian advances during the time period uh, really did not diminish, it only increased, and so in, in that regard, it wasn't able to play a role in reducing the amount of effects of Russian advances in those regions. Then the other argument would be that it helped prevent a Russian Sumi operation, which there could be an argument as to whether that was imminent or not. That would really depend on the troop concentrations. And I think based on the fact that the Russian forces were overrun so quickly in this region, uh, north of Sumy, for instance, it shows that there wasn't a large concentration of forces being built up in this region. And the main focus was still on the Volchansk area. So uh, maybe in the abstract, there was thinking about it and planning for the long term. Uh, and probably the calculus hasn't shifted that much as a result. But now the calculus is that, yes, the Russian forces have around 50K troops in this region. Uh, could be a bit less depending on the way that you're counting the size of some of these units over here. But then proportionally comparing the fact that Russian forces here are of a certain high caliber, that is true. A lot of the VDV forces are rather strong. Uh, and then you look at the Ukrainian side, they also have some relatively strong units here that were recently moved in, mechanized forces, not that many territorial defense brigades. Uh, it's all about proportions because uh, a larger proportion of strong Ukrainian units that have the ability to both attack and defend, they've been moved to this area in comparison to the Russian forces who have moved a smaller proportion, and they do still have large quantities of units that are able to continue with offensive activities in key parts of the front line. So just from that perspective, it is uh, not good for the Ukrainians, especially given the fact that they diverted some forces away as well to attack in the Glushkovo area to sort of counteract the Russian counterattacks that were occurring southeast of Kurinovo. And now there's actually reporting from pro-Russian sources that the Russians have from, from the 155th Marine Brigade were able to repel the Ukrainians and push them out of Veselo and Obuchovka. And now only the Ukrainians are present in Noviput. That cannot be confirmed, so we'll have to wait and see. Now to look at the Kupiansk and broader Oskil front, we're going to zoom in here, see a Russian advance westwards just south of Sipovo Novoselivka. So this is important because the rail axis uh, the Russians were able to ga galvanize off of their earlier capture of Kislivka and Kotlyarivka. At the time when they were captured, I talked about how it would give a blooming effect for the Russians as they would only have to focus on one more village before having an open route all the way to the outskirts of Kupiansk. And now we're reaching the point where the Russians are focusing on that final nut that has to crack, specifically Sipovo and Ovasilivka, as I said before. And uh, looking at the specific distance between the current line of contact and outskirts like Petropavlivka and Kucherivka, they actually are really strong. If you look at them, uh, maybe they will not be ready for such intense assaults from a second flank, from the southern flank. So that's something that they have to keep in mind. Right now, the Russians are about 12 kilometers, maybe if you're being generous, 11 kilometers away from those positions. And they do have an area that is relatively open, spanning five or six kilometers before they reach the Ukrainian trench positions that are rather well built in this region. So the Russian advance amounts to 0.64 kilometers, and it's based on a geolocation from the Ukrainian side showing an FEV strike onto a certain rail stop nearby. And so not to zoom a bit to uh, southwards over here, deep say they admitted that the Russians fully captured the village of Miozo Zharivka. So this is an area that's been holding up for a while despite Russian attacks concurrently occurring 
to the north and south in Selma Kivka and on Rivka respectively. So the garrison here was able to hold out for a very long time. Now the front line is sort of lined up with what it should be naturally. And the line of contact is sort of based off of the border over here. You can see the border between the blasts over here marked in red. And you don't have as many villages in this region. You don't have as many static positions. And so this is an opportunity long term for Russian exploitation several kilometers deeper into the Ukrainian line towards areas like Vishnevra, Zeleny Hall. And by then you actually reach Ukraine's rear trenches and those ones are, are relatively dense. But until you reach that point, if we're going to measure it out for a second, it is only about, uh, you know, eight kilometers at the least or the most around 10 kilometers. Now, in regards to, to Severus Front, it is really important to clarify and I actually mentioned this in my last video where I had plastered into the video uh, section about Tversk that you had Russian sources hyping up the announcement by the Russian MOD of the capture of Verkhovno Kamianska, for instance, uh, and they, in all likelihood, they used a drone to drop a Russian flag onto the western edge of the village, and that gave the illusion that it was actually under full Russian control. Now you have post hoc Russian sources talking about how no they have not captured it it's probably contested with the eastern portion in the gray zone while the ukrainians are in control of most of the village uh there's not a really strong russian presence nearby although the situation for the ukrainians likely has deteriorated in the severus fronts and we actually know about this for sure because of developments that occurred in recent months near spirini ivanodarovka along the rail line over here in northeast of Vesele in rosdolivka that is all true but uh, along with that, you have a huge hype that probably isn't backed up with enough evidence. And I said in my previous video that although the geolocations are there to prove that there probably uh, was a possibility of a Russian advance, that the door was open for perhaps the Russians not actually being in control of those areas due to the Ukrainian sources disputing the fact that Russians had taken it over, saying that the Ukrainians were still in those regions. So Petrenko said that, for instance, and Deep State never changed their map. And for now, I'm going to mark it to reflect what those two sources were saying, that in all likelihood, Verkhno Kamianska is largely under Ukrainian control. And then Hryharivka is under Ukrainian control. The route leading into it, for now, I don't know if it's a gray zone or if it's still under the hands of the 81st Air Assault Brigade. That's something that has to be elaborated upon. Also, the 27th Infantry Brigade is here uh, because, again, the footage here, it is simply not conclusive to prove strong control over such areas that held on for so long over the course of two years. Now, looking at New York, here we have some important Russian advances. First off, we have here a video from the 206th Territorial Defense Battalion of the 241st Brigade. So they conducted this operation of PVs, or not FPVs, but drones, dropping grenades onto Ukrainian strong points just east of Nelipivka, which you see over here on the map. So the strong point, it includes a local memorial for a battle, a World War II battle in Toretsk. And also there's a water pumping station nearby. So the Ukrainians, of course, converted this entire region into a very strong defensive area with trenches interwoven. And eventually individual Russian squads actually overran it. And in the video, you could see a couple of Russian soldiers just meandering over there, holding on to it. And then they encountered the grenades and were targeted by them. And that's a confirmation that this stronghold has actually fallen into Russian control along two routes. So this route, for instance, over here, at least directly into the center of Nelipivka. So that could be important for future Russian attacks. And then to the south, you have this route vertically leading into the local mine in southern Zabalka that is still under Ukrainian control. And some of the final remnants of Zabalka residential areas that the Ukrainians maintain control over along with all these trenches that are just west of the electrical substation. So those are some defensive regions that have to be cleared out by the Russians. But based on this geolocation, it confirms to us that an area amounting to 1.64 kilometers, which includes mostly open areas, but also some trenches, has now been cleared out by the Russian forces, meaning they can focus more of their resources on the eastern flank of Nelipivka. That is really important because the garrison here, the Ukrainian one, from whether it be 12th Azov uh, Brigade or some of the other units like Varon or TDF elements, they have been able to stabilize the situation in Nelipivka itself to prevent uh, New York from becoming a stepping stone to attack into the chain of villages along the rail line. Uh, same thing with the Russian infiltration that occurred in mid-September into Leonidivka that 
did not succeed in creating a permanent change to the front line with the Ukrainians eventually able to regain territory located south of that region. But recently, the Russians have resumed their attacks, not trying to infiltrate for depth, but trying to gain control over a broader area that includes tree lines. So here you can see just west of New York, an area mined the three square kilometers. It's a Russian advance northeast of Sukhabalka as well. I think that's part of the calculation here because you can see that there are a lot of vertical trenches built that are in between the Sukhabalka region. Basically, it's part of the front line that uh, I suppose it runs along open areas. I'll, I'll actually show it to you guys over here. It's this six square kilometer, six kilometer area, and it's relatively exposed, which is why the trenches were built to sort of separate the western region from the area that is connected to New York that has all of the villages and the rail line and any sort of breakthrough in this region by the Russians it would give them an open area to roam through to really advance deep into and it would create a lot of issues for the flanks of defensive structures such as Sukhobalka and the chain of villages located south of it. Same thing for the very strong Ukrainian defenses that are also centered around trenches located south of said villages in areas like Kalinove or Stara Mikolaevka. And so it will be a part of a broader plan to essentially expel the Ukrainians from this salient. This is a really large salient, but it's a region that has prevented deeper Russian infiltrations into an area, for instance, like southern Kostantinivka or any of the trenches located south of the highway. So that would be a long-term Russian objective and would require much more of a dependency, a commitment of forces than we're seeing right now. But we could see how the battlefield is being shaped in a way that would allow for the very least an area like Sukhobalka to fall with northern flanking attempts. It could also be a part of operations to uh, once again attack towards Leonidivka. But for now, the situation there is not radically changed. Looking just north of Novo Oleksandrivka, here there is a marginal Russian advance amounting to 0.8 square kilometers through open fields. Again, this is an area that I talked about extensively over the past several months when the uh, really center of gravity in the Pokrovsk front was much more focused on the Ocharotina region. And I said there was a possibility of wide scale Russian advances along this region over here, Mark the Next, which is located on higher elevation and would flank an area like Kalinova and its trenches. For now, there's no indication that it's happening. I do just think that it is slowly chipping away at the current Ukrainian control. And before we get any idea of, you know, larger operations going on over there, it's going to have a lot to do with what's going on in other parts of the Pokrovsk front and the order of battle, which I think definitely is focused on an area south of Mirnohod, for instance, where we're seeing a lot of Russian advances in recent days. As reported by Deep State, for instance, the full capture of Mikolaevka, Krasnyar, and Krutyar has already happened, with the Russian forces advancing over the past two days, 2.5 square kilometers, getting control over the final outskirts, and branching out past Novohordivka along the rail line, branching out past the uh, local Terracon. And this is a really powerful axis of advance because it's a perfect route for infantry along the windbreaks, really using two sets of windbreaks actually, going in diverging directions. And then also because it's located on an embankment that gives the Russians at the very least an elevation parity to a lot of the nearby Ukrainian positions as they try to infiltrate past the uh, Ukrainian outer ring of defense that is defending the southern outskirts of Mirnorhod at the present moment. In Selidova, the 1st Battalion of the 15th National Guard Brigade has recently posted two videos geolocated. They were posted on Instagram, and you could actually see uh, the links on my map. The first one is interesting. It shows that there was an abandoned vehicle. It's unclear whether it was Russian or Ukrainian, although Russian side was trying to claim that it was a Bradley. And it was right next to the rail line, the rail line that used to be the dividing area between the Russian and Ukrainian forces. And it shows how the FPV destroyed that abandoned vehicle. That's from October 10th. Then another video shows that a BTR-4 of the 1st Battalion was able to make it to the positions of the Russians in the reinforced concrete plant. And this is a really important area because it is just south of the Korchenka mine. The Korchenka mine is the most imminent height overlooking the entirety of Selidove. There are other heights nearby that the Russians control, like the Terracon that is just to the east of the line of contact over here. Those are in high elevation, undoubtedly, but by far the best position, specific position to take over that would give you an amazing vantage point and firing point onto Selidove is the Korchenka mine. 
and I never marked it as under Russian control. A lot of, a lot of Russian sources did and are now backtracking and saying that the Ukrainians counterattacked. I don't even know if that's true. There's a good chance that the Ukrainians simply never lost it in the first place. But in any case, they were able to launch attacks from that direction using the BTR-4, and they fired onto the Russian positions near the concrete plant. And for me, that actually was marked as an advance compared to the previous line of contact. So there was a marginal Russian gain over here. Now, looking at the Kurokova front, this is rather interesting. It is something admitted by both Petrenko and Deep State. That there has been a Russian infiltration taking over a certain chunk of Ostrivka. And you can actually see here in the geolocation that was released on October 7th or even later than that. But the video itself, which was recorded by the Russian 5th Motor Rifle Brigade, it's labeled as October 3rd. And so, again, that would be nine days ago. It's a while ago. And I don't want to use that video that is pretty outdated in relative terms as an extrapolation of the current front line. Because, again, you're talking about events that could have been repelled in the matter of hours, let alone nine days. And so you can't really assume that since then the front line has not changed for either side, actually. And so regardless of that, what the video shows is essentially an armored column, a rather large one advancing along the windbreaks over here past what I previously had marked as under Russian control through the windbreaks and into us roofs gets out, dismounts troops, and then the vehicles get out. And then we don't know what happened to those troops in the day since. That's what I'm wondering about. But based on that video and uh, based on just general information, two Ukrainian sources did mention it as now being infiltrated by the Russian side. And so uh, based on that combination of factors, then I'm also going to make the change on my map. But again, there's always a possibility, as with Severisk, although the situation here is a bit different, that in the day since the attack here has actually been repelled and the Ukrainians do still have a presence within Ostrivska. But it is really important that they have one. It would be important for them to maintain it if they do have one, I should say, because it acts as a fabric east of the Vavta River between the local command garrison, the local hub of Krakova, and then northwards towards the eastern bank of the Vavta River near Alexander Peel, or, for instance, Zelena Druhe, which is being hit very heavily by Russian drones. And, of course, the western bank, like Kurakivka, Hironik, etc. So losing that connection, it really does create a fork between two different parts of this front line that are uh, the relatively close together but if there was no coordination then it makes it difficult to act together as a single defensive body it's rather interesting because the 46th brigade they actually released footage of fevs attacking the same russian column on october 3rd and that they definitely show some damage caused to those columns in the russian video you can't really see that much damage but you can see that there was artillery and fev is very active and a lot of smoke is rising from those particular wind breaks and then on october 8th there was another russian attack that was largely repelled by the 46th brigade so it's possible that some of those vehicles slipped through the cracks in those specific incidents and actually were able to create a, a permanent difference in ostrovska and finally now looking at vodiane we're going to zoom in and you'll see there is an advance amounting to 1.4 square kilometers Based on a video from the Ukrainian side, I'm marking it over here, October 12th. It's from the 72nd Brigade's Bulava FPV drone units, and they conducted a strike onto an abandoned Russian infantry fighting vehicle just to the south of this local trend system. So you can see that's a very important Ukrainian objective at the moment to hold on to it. I mean, whereas the Russians, they're trying to inch closer, eliminate the flank, the eastern flank of Bohoyavlanka, use that as a vector through which to attack. And that would be done in conjunction with attacks coming in from armored columns along specific routes like ravines or local routes. And that would be enough to begin the battles within the settlement itself. And so that's all I have for today. Thank you all so much for watching. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.